Well, good morning um, and welcome to what I hope will be an informative and interesting discussion regarding the EV revolution. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gavin Manger. Uh, I have for my sins been involved in parking and transportation for over 30 years now. And I'm currently working uh, as a solutions manager for Zap Park. As Zap Park provide a range of software solutions to the parking industry from processing through to permits, through to processing payments. Uh, I think the first thing I'd like to do is thank Zap Park and Land of Conferences for organizing this webinar. Um, we're very grateful for their ongoing support, uh, especially in this time where face-to-face -face meetings are very few and far between. Uh, please do remember to post uh, any questions um, to the panel that you may have. Um, hopefully we can get through, um, if not all of them, the majority of them at the end of the presentations. Um, and please do keep posting them throughout the, um, the presentations. Today our panelists are Alistair Cameron from NCP, Craig Taylor from Cornwall Council and Simon Kendrew from Energy. Uh, they will be discussing the measures that they are putting in place as they or their organisations prepare for the adoption of the EV revolution. With less than 10 years to go before you will no longer be able to buy a car with an internal combustion engine, and I have been informed this morning it's slightly longer for some hybrids, I personally am interested to understand if our country is ready for this. What are the organisations within the industry doing to prepare for what will be a revolution? It's the government plan to achieve a net zero carbon emission by 2050. Clearly for the car industry, this is complicated. However, it almost brings immense challenges for us as well. There will clearly be a massive rollout of infrastructure required for LA's private companies and suppliers. On a personal level, I would like to buy an electric vehicle. However, I have some very obvious concerns. Range anxiety, which everyone talks about. Infrastructure, um, very similar. Where can I charge on the way to where I'm going? And the cost, how much are these cars going to cost? On a professional level, I'd like to understand how we're going to charge for EV parking, how are the local authorities and private companies going to pay for it? Um, how will the charging points be enforced by local authorities and private companies? And actually understanding the financial models for the companies. Um, and as I said, and those of you who know me, I drive a very old, rusty, much loved Land Rover, um, which I don't want to give up. So I'm hoping today that um, I will be persuaded or not uh, to adopt the EV revolution. Um, the first speaker today will be Alistair Cameron from NCP. Uh, Alistair is leading the national sales as well as the EV and partnership strategy across NCP and joined the company earlier this year following 17 years in the corporate travel industry, working across both Europe and Asia. His experience in bringing together large and small companies with a passion for sales and client management, employing a partnership approach to ensure mutual success. He's now pivoting to the world of intensification and EV applying, applying that same customer focused approach to drive engagement and experience. So, Alistair, over to you. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the panel today uh, and share what we're doing here at NCP to get our operation ready for EV. Um, so NCP, as a business, we've been operating car parks for 90 or so years. Uh, so we feel we've got a fair amount of experience when it comes to the business of parking. Uh, and being one of the largest operators in the UK, we have around 500 or so locations, which equates to 220,000 parking spaces, give or take. Uh, so when we want to go EV, big on EV, we, we need a, a fair few chargers. But with all those parking spaces, it means that we've got the scale uh, and freedom of choice uh, backed up by the latest technology, uh, a broad range of products and services to help both uh, consumers and businesses alike. So in our 90 years or so of history, um, we've been uh, owned by a number of companies since Fred Lucas founded us in, in 1931, uh, and currently we're owned by uh, Park24, uh, a Japanese-listed company, and DBJ, uh, the Development Bank of Japan. Park24, as uh, there's a slight hint in the name, they are a major parking operator uh, across eight countries. They have 19,000 sites and over a million parking spaces. Um, and alongside DBJ, they are a uh, active uh, owner of NCP. 
uh, and a sophisticated investor with a, with a strong track record in, in infrastructure finance. So as I mentioned from the products and services that we have, they've, they've broad uh, and cover the typical usage that you'd find within a car park. So we offer the ability to pre-book space. Um, you can just pay up, uh, turn up, sorry, and pay as you go. Uh, and then there's the classic commuter product of season tickets. Uh, and we recently introduced with the advent of hybrid working and everyone uh, working out how they're going to go back to the office, we've introduced two and three day options, um, which are going absolute gangbusters with with both consumers and businesses alike as they try and flex to the new way of working and how they're going to fill their offices with um, the same number of staff but less space. Uh, and lastly, we've got a credit facility, a corporate credit facility, which is primarily used by large fleets uh, across the country, um, all backed up by um, our industry leading technology uh, and parking tech so that across the estate we're continuing to cycle products and bring in the latest innovation from the parking industry. So we've got barrierless car parks, uh, auto and post pay functionality, uh, as well as the ability to extend your stay um, for those on pay as you go. As Gavin mentioned, my role is one of national sales and partnerships. National sales, for us, we engage with corporates to provide regional uh, and national solutions for their parking requirements. And secondly, the area of partnerships, which is uh, why I'm with you all today uh, is one of intensification. So looking at products and solutions that complement the vehicle or, cons or consumer relationship with us. Uh, and currently, and unsurprisingly, uh, the majority of my time is taken up with electric vehicle charging, uh, which uh, hopefully moves us on to the next slide. EV across the NCP estate is evolving. Um, there are a number of models that, from a parking uh, operator perspective, that parking operators can adopt. We historically have adopted a rent uh, a model where we rented space to to various CPOs, so charge point operators. However, we're now in the process of changing that to allow NCP to work with suppliers to design and to integrate the customer parking and charging journey into one. Uh, it's a process process we're currently in the middle of, uh, so it's a pretty good time for me to be able to share some of the findings uh, that we've found through our investigations uh, potentially answer some questions. There are many considerations and this is a slide that I come back to time and time again to make sure that I'm off all of the various considerations that we have. First and foremost though is as a parking operator is the location that you've got uh, and from the data that you might have the associated demographic that would be that is currently utilizing your site. Uh, so is it a commuter site? Is it a high churn? short dwell type site. Uh, knowing this through your data will help define how you will choose to connect with the customer base and what you'll choose to offer uh, when it comes to EV charging. Will it be super fast? Will it be fast? Will it be will it be slow? So here and as Gavin said I'm 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 a newbie when it comes to parking. Uh, I had a sort of slight light bulb moment. Um, not hugely exciting but uh, it relates to the fact that Typically, car parks are a 12-hour operating, 12-hour uh, operation. Uh, when you install EV, you suddenly have the ability to turn that 12 hours into 24, uh, because depending on location, you can either provide overnight charging to nearby residents that either don't have the space or don't have the um, don't have the capability to install chargers. Alternatively, and once again, dependent on location. Um, the advent of fleet farms is becoming incredibly popular. So fleets need somewhere to charge their um, vans and cars overnight, uh, and car parks are typically fairly empty overnight. So there is a there is a, a nice synergy uh, or potential for synergies there. Uh, and when you if you do get into the fleet farm type setup, there are many other intensification opportunities that make the whole proposition fairly exciting. So once we, from an NCP perspective, has decided on the sites and how we might go about um, integrating with the um, with EV and and providing that the customers the charge the ability to charge, we took the decision to engage with a, with a a good number of suppliers. So I think to date I've probably engaged with nine or ten suppliers to understand how they line up against our defined requirements, um, and it helps us most definitely from a learning perspective because there's there's a lot to learn in this area 
uh, but also helps us distill our requirements to, to check that we are doing the right things in the right way. Some of the highlights uh, that I think I'd call out uh, when speaking to suppliers are the ability to integrate. So if you have a parking app, do you want to integrate charging within that parking app? Do you, do you need to? Are you happy to keep it separate? Uh, is there a white label um, product from the supplier that may be able to uh, be simply skinned and, and look like your look like the version of your normal parking app but an EV version. We then step into the world of interoperability um, uh, and here's where there are various standards and protocols uh, which allow a parking operator to choose various suppliers uh, of various CPOs and have aligned experience and aligned back offices. So the, the typical ones that I seem to come across at the moment uh, relate to OCPP and OCPI, which relate to the charger itself and then the interface that sits behind it. Um, but there are many more. Uh, and as EV evolves, um, I think there are many more protocols and standards that will help keep it um, simpler for us, the end users. We then have the how are you going to pay for the charging as, a, as an end user? Um, Typically, that would be an RFID, which sits within a, a dedicated card for that particular supplier or potentially a FOB, uh, or there are some that are just plain contactless where there is no app required whatsoever and it's just you go and tap and off you go. Which then leads neatly on to what are you going to charge and, and how they're going to pay for it. So um, the tariff border to car park, as I've worked out in my last four months, can be fairly confusing and also fairly lengthy. So the question is, how do you want to price your kilowatt hours? Uh, so for example, if you have a commuter site, um, the majority of which you've got season ticket customers in there, do you want to offer free charging to season ticket customers for a, for a, for a flat fee? Um, if it's more of a high churn site, do you want to have a pay-as-you-go product? Um, if you do opt for the latter of a pay-as-you-go product at a high churn site, you need to find the... Um, the challenging balance of how do you encourage people to move on once they've started charging um, because you want to encourage the churn but at the same time you want to offer charging. All of this once you've sorted it out will provide you with some very strong data and reporting um, which at the end of the day can be some of the gold dust that we're all after and to, and to understand our customers more and to be able to offer them more aligned products and services. Otherwise there are some other nuances to to get involved with the likes of load balancing. So for example, if you have 10 chargers and 10 people turn up, do you offer them equal kilowatt hours or do you dedicate the first one to have the most use and then the, the last one has less and it rotates as people leave? Uh, and the ability to reserve a charger, which is something we're heavily considering at the moment as part of a pre-book uh, opportunity. So you know you're going from home to Milton Keynes, for example, you know where you want to park, I'd like to pre-book my charger uh, so that when you turn up, you know that you've got the opportunity to park your park to park and charge. So in the case of uh, Gavin, if he gets batteries installed in his Land Rover and many others, you could uh, you could um, you could allay that um, range anxiety fear because you've got somewhere to park uh, and charge when you get there. Obviously, once you've considered all of these uh, and as a parking operator, one of the most critical elements is, is it's actually getting power to site because typically car parks don't consume that much power uh, in standard day-to-day -day operations but for EV they you will need to so for for us here at NCP we've engaged with uh, the CPOs we're working with and they will engage with the DNOs so the network um, distributors to upgrade our capacity and cables um, and here's where you there is another uh, slight nuance to how you might choose to operate your site depending on where you sit in relation to a substation uh, will depend on the amount of capex you need to you need to set aside to get power to site uh, in the process of doing that and if you in engaging with your with your CPO there is the opportunity to talk batteries uh, and then there is the obviously when you have a battery there's the ability to store surplus from the grid because the grid currently generates uh, and will offload power where it can so there's the ability for you to store power. For us we're, we're in the process of um, mapping out how we might take that one step further 
and that is the um, that's the use of through the use of solar panels. Uh, if you imagine from all of us on the on the call, and hopefully there are lots uh, of attendees, we probably all have a fair amount of space across our estate for, from a parking perspective, uh, and the ability for all of those um, that face the sun to generate power, store power, and then sell it back to the grid and support everyone's desire for, for net zero and, and an additional energy generation. So that kind of sort of draws me to the end of my my considerations. Um, but uh, as as was um, mentioned earlier, whilst we're having a discussion before we we kicked off, there are some other things that you do need to sort of uh, consider and uh, work out the answers to. Which is what do you do when someone is charging and they're full? You want to encourage them to move on. You want to encourage someone else to use that space. How do you go about doing that? Uh, and as we still have more combustion vehicles versus electric vehicles, there is uh, there is the icing taking place, which is where a combustion vehicle very naughtily takes on an EV bay uh, and is obviously not able to charge. So how do you deal with that? Uh, we have some views from an NCP perspective, um, uh, and that all relates to enforcement or encouragement and then enforcement. But um, we can probably discuss that through some questions later on. So. From an NCP perspective, it really comes down to defining what you want to offer to the customers uh, and focusing on how the customer will consume the new the new solution you're offering, and then finding a partner that supports, understands, and ultimately challenges you in that regard. So, so that's it from me, and I'll hand back to Gavin. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm personally very glad to see that um, NCP has survived the last 18 years without me. I used to work there a long time ago. Um, I, I, very interesting, actually, and I do like I like the term fleet farms, and perhaps we can come back and discuss that uh, towards the end. Uh, and also, I think enforcement of bays, that's certainly been something that um, people have been talking about and, and I've discussed with, with local authorities for a long time now. So thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, our second panellist, um, again, I also have uh, a long history with. Craig and I first met 30-odd um, years ago. Um, Craig Taylor is the strategic parking manager for Cornwall Council. As I said, Craig began working in the parking sector at 17 as a parking attendant in the city of London. Uh, he is clearly much younger than me and has just over 30 years of experience working within both the public and the private sector. Uh, in Cornwall, he's instrumental in developing the positive parking framework for Cornwall Council, and he's a keen advocate of, of positive benefits and good parking management to deliver and is working closely with the BPA to ensure the aims of the positive parking agenda are promoted. Lots of P's there. Uh, Craig, I will hand over to you and um, we'll catch up at the end of your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gavin, and uh, thank you for uh, asking me to be part of today. Um, could I have my first slide, please, if that's okay? Uh, by way of introduction, uh, hello everyone, I'm Craig Taylor, I'm the Strategic Parking Manager for Cornwall Council. We're a, a large unitary authority in the southwest of England. Um, we operate around 280 car parks, 133 of which um, are charging car parks. Um, we've currently got a very low number of EV charge points within council car parks, but we've recently secured um, ERDF funding um, and we've sort of put some match funding towards it. Um, and we've got £3.6 million project to install another 150 new charge points throughout um, Cornwall Council car parks. Um, this will help to meet one of the principles of the positive parking framework for Cornwall, which um, was developed in 2018. Uh, can I have my next slide, please? Thank you. So the aim of the positive parking framework for Cornwall um, was to provide a framework for, for managing Cornwall's car parking against objectives of supporting the economy, particularly the environment and uh, of course our communities and one of the overriding principles was by 2030 um, you will be able to charge electric vehicles in most Cornwall Council uh, car parks. Thank you. Next slide. So I thought I'd put this information together um, for any public or private parking operators who are considering buying and installing EV charge points um, in order to support staff, visitors and local residents who drive EVs. I mean, we're very much um, at the start of our journey in terms of uh, implementing large scale EV charge points. Um, but I thought this would be useful in terms of 
uh, some of the things that you might not have considered when 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 thinking about installing. Could I have um, the next slide? Thanks very much. So just some stats that I pulled off um, the web recently. The EV char, uh, car market, as we know, is is growing very quickly. Um, there's around 260,000 pure EVs on the road. That was to May 21. Uh, and that's that doesn't include um, hybrid plug-in models, so that boosts the figure to about 535,000. Um, that's an increase of 175,000 in the last last year alone, uh, which is a 66% increase on 1920. Thank you. So in terms of the information I've put together, I thought it may be useful to run through a few of the elements of the EV installation that we deem as, as being important considerations. So uh, I'm going to cover the vital role of the distribution network operator, which Alistair uh, mentioned earlier on, the location choice, uh, the cost of installation and commissioning. Um, and this, this isn't necessarily for the charge point operator themselves itself, but um, more to do with the, the electricity connections and uh, the impacts on the car park operations, which, which Alistair again alluded to um, a little bit earlier on. Thank you. So in terms of the, the DNA or well, the dis distribution network operator, um, that is um, Western Power down in Cornwall, um, but obviously that will differ throughout the UK. Um, they have provided a very useful guide, which is available on their website, and I'm sure the DNOs in your own areas have probably got similar, similar useful uh, information available to you. Um, so I would advise engaging with your DNO early. Um, as I said, it, it is Western Power uh, in our area. They're, they're licensed to distribute the energy from, from the national grid. Uh, they maintain the cabling and the overhead lines and, and the substations. They will connect new charge points to the, to the power network. Now that might be through, through the charge point operator, um, but they will need to understand um, the connection characteristics of the charge points that you're thinking of operating. Um, and uh, assess whether there is sufficient local capacity to enable that connection. Um, if there's insufficient capacity, they will need to be engaged in order to increase um, that, that, that capacity where necessary. And that can be quite time consuming and, and costly depending on the location. Thanks very much. In terms of location choice, um, Alistair again sort of discussed, mentioned it earlier on. Uh, typically, car parks, you know, have have lower powered connections for lights and a few meters at the moment. Um, but so a, a key consideration is whether or not um, where you're thinking of siting the the units um, are they going to be uh, accessible, uh, and what are the what are the surroundings? Are are you going to be a, you know is it going to be easy to connect to the local local supply, or will uh, it require expensive civil works? Um, what is the proximity to the existing EV charging infrastructure? So are there other um, charging uh, places in, in the local vicinity that, we, that might you know, impact on your own, your own uh, availability? Uh, so are there shops perhaps in the, in services nearby that people will be, will be visiting uh, whilst charging? Because that will obviously uh, play a, a key impact on, on, on whether your, your charge points are going to be, going to be used. Um, what's site accessibility like? So, um, you know, if you're thinking about charging or enabling adapted vehicles, for instance, to be able to access those those sites, um, is it is it are they accessible? So, you know, are the are the car parking spaces accessible? Um, who will your potential users be? be? You know, will will you be thinking about short term um, customers who may be coming into town or nipping into town for half an hour to an hour, or are you thinking about providing charges for uh, overnight stays, as Alistair alluded to, uh, or long stay customers, and, and obviously when is the charging infrastructure infrastructure needed? So is it is it needed during the day or or, over, or overnight, as was mentioned before? Thanks very much. In terms of the costs of installation, um, they can be costly, and so new new electrical connection costs can impact on the financial vi viability of the new charging installation. So I think it's important to consider. Um, can the existing electrical supply accommodate the new charging infrastructure? Uh, how many EVs do you do you want to charge at any one time? Uh, what type of charge points are you, are you going to be providing? You know, fast, rapid, etc. Um, and also, what types of EVs are you thinking of charging? So, you know, is it is it uh, cars? Is it vans? Is it buses or trucks? <laughs> um, maybe it will be drones in the future. <laughs> um, how quickly do you want to charge them? 
Um, as I said before, what is the spare capacity? And this is why it's important to, to, to engage with the DLO um, earlier on. Um, rapid charges in particular are likely to require additional capacity. Um, and so, you know, the DNA will, will be able to advise you of, of that. Um, the cost of the possible network reinforcement is is and can be considerable. So my next slide sort of gives an indication, and this was taken from the Western Power um, sort of information on, online. Um, this sort of gives you an indication of the types of costs that you might be needed to consider. So a fast charger, the connection itself might take eight to 12 weeks through the DNA. Um, you know, it may be between a thousand and three thousand three thousand pounds and and may require some additional street work costs. But the costs ramp up quite considerably when you thought when you're talking about you know two two rapid chargers or or twenty. And you may, in terms of time frame, it might be impacted quite heavily because those uh, that resilience on the network might might need to be considered in more depth. So it quite it ramps up uh, and it may make the project unviable. So it's worth considering these earlier on. Um, other considerations that you may need to, you know, to think about, as I said before, street work costs, legal costs for easements and way leaves, and obviously planning permission and, and, and cost of land for a for a substation if if necessary. Thanks very much. Um, lastly, um, the impacts on the current car park operation. So other things that you might want to consider about the the car park itself and how may how it may impact on that. So. EV charge bays tend to be larger, so uh, that may impact on the availability of normal parking bays, which again may impact on on the revenue that's coming through through the car park. Now it's clear that we need to be providing more um, more EV charging throughout the UK, um, particularly on Cornwall on council car parks. But you know how is that going to impact on on the revenue uh, through through the the standard parking charge? And I suppose one of the considerations is do we charge for the parking? And the charging, or do we charge for for them both together? So um, there may be also be impacts on the parking place order, so and the enforcement of the of the spaces. So as Gavin was mentioning earlier, um, your parking place orders may need to be changed to enable that enforcement to take place. Um, obviously, uh, private operators don't operate under parking place orders, but you know there may be contractual reasons to to have a look at them to have a look at that. Um, say some pay by phone operators and machine manufacturers are already providing sort of dual payment options um, to customers. Uh, so it might be worth engaging with your current supplier to see if, if um, that's an option that they can provide moving forward. Um, and there may be additional revenue options. Uh, vehicle to grid is being um, discussed um, quite widely now. Where you know the vehicle to grid, sorry, technology enables power to be pushed back to the national grid from the vehicle battery, which could generate revenue um, to the local authority or the company, which you know may offset some of the lost revenue that you may experience from the spaces being uh, slightly larger. Um, we've received uh, European development funding for you know to assist with our installations, but other grants are available. So another thing to consider, you know, uh, is, is whether grant grants are available to help you uh, to assist you with your installations. Thanks very much. That's uh, that's me. Um, if you've got any further questions or comments, please put them in the in the chat bar. But um, if you want to contact me um, individually, then please do. Thanks, Gavin. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, we're having a few questions um, about why we're unable to see Craig's handsome face. Um, he's <laughs> down in the depths of Cornwall, and if we have his 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 face and words, um, the delay is 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 unmanageable. So we decided that words were better. So I hope that answers some some questions. But Craig is definitely here um, and taking part. Um, so thank you very much, Craig. Well, uh, it's interesting. You sort of touched on mobility hubs and people being able to charge while doing other services. So perhaps have a think about that, and we can come back to that at the end of end of the presentations. Sure. Uh, yeah. And you also talked about charging, and it's something that has been puzzling me. Again, do we charge for the for the space, or do we charge for electricity, or both? So again, it would be good perhaps to come back and touch on that in a minute. So so thank you very much, Craig. I appreciate you you joining us. Thank you. Um, so our final panellist, I have, you'll be pleased to hear, I have no connection with at all other than um, when we asked him to join um, this discussion and have had some enlightening conversations since, um, but it's only been a, a couple of days. So Simon Kenju is the marketing director for NG's electric vehicle business. He has over 20 years experience working with leading brands across a range of sectors that include telecoms, retail, energy, finance and technology. So 
I'm going to hand over to Simon now, but just a quick reminder before he starts, um, any questions, please do put them in the question box because um, we're coming towards the end of the presentations and we will um, hopefully have a very lively debate. So over to you, Simon, and, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Gavin, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Simon Kendry, Marketing Director for uh, NG's EV Solutions Business. Uh, and today I'd like to uh, cover three things. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction to, um, to what we do uh, and to the business and some of the uh, types of projects we're involved in. Um, I'll then come on to pick up on some of the key trends that we're seeing as a, as a network operator within this market and, and hopefully that will um, help inform some of the, the, the thinking perhaps of, of, of yourselves and then finally move on to some, uh, some considerations that we see from the operator side. Um, and, and positive thing actually is that there's definitely a synergy uh, with uh, some of the, the key themes from Alistair and, and Craig so far. So next slide, please. Um, so just uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, we, um, uh, for, from an internal perspective, quite excitingly, uh, we, we've launched within NG a, a new uh, operating entity that we've called Equans. Um, it's not really out in the market yet. This is actually the first presentation I've done uh, introducing uh, this new operating division. Uh, but what Equans does is, is really pull together all of the, the service elements of, of what NG operates. So NG are a, a global energy and services business and Equans is, is now the, uh, the services arm of, of NG. Um, we, we operate across, uh, as it says on the slide, you know, good, a good number of countries uh, with around 74,000 people globally. Within the UK, uh, we're about 13,500 strong. And um, the electric vehicle and green mobility operations all sit within uh, within Quans. Um, so thinking about what we do within this space, we've, we've got two parts to the business. Uh, the first part is where we deliver third party uh, charging services. So to, um, to companies who want to transition their fleets or provide uh, services um, within their offices or depots, uh, we can install, um, you know, spec, manage, deliver, uh, uh, charges that we would term sort of private charges. That's for their uh, for their use. Um, we also operate uh, at a public level uh, the Genie Point network, which is a, a public charging network where we are investing in installing and growing that network. We've now got around 450 uh, rapid chargers um, and, and a few hundred um, sort of slower slow paced chargers within within that uh, within that business. And we support around about 100,000 individual EV drivers who, who have signed up to the, the Genie Point network. Uh, and all of this is delivered through 100% renewable electricity. And, and, and the real focus that we have within NG is around supporting clients in making the transition to zero carbon. We talk around making zero carbon happen. Um, and really, you know, how, how we can enable that with our, with our customers. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we do work across a full range of sectors, and I think thinking about today uh, and, and, and some of the topics, what's quite interesting are the type of projects that, that we're doing for, for these companies. So uh, just as an example, the likes of NatWest and Ford, we're, we're doing a lot of work um, uh, installing charges at their sites um, for their uh, transitions of, of fleets uh, and for their employees. Uh, so, so that's much more of a sort of private network side. And then when we get out into, into the public network, uh, this is where we tend to work with uh, retailers, leisure providers, um, also local authorities, and, and essentially people who have access to, um, to land. And, and, and with the likes of Morrison's, with Whitbread, uh, we are, you know, we're installing assets on, on, their, um, on their land. Uh, and, and we put in place then a commercial agreement. So, um, this is where um, NG are actually funding uh, the installation of these sites. It links into some of the some of the pieces that uh, Alistair and uh, and Craig touched on. Uh, so we, as as the CPO, will actually take the commercial risk. Uh, we'll agree access to land on a, a typically a long term a long term lease, and then there will be a lease and, and revenue share agreement that gives our customers the ability to both uh, deliver new services for for their customers. So you know, in the space for a retailer or, or you know, for a local authority helping um, with their uh, sort of local um, climate and sustainability targets, 
um, and uh, and also opening up sort of new revenue streams uh, for those uh, for those customers. Um, next slide, uh, please. So when when the end user uh, engages within uh, within this this market, um, <coughs> we are you know we're, we're very much thinking about the the charger itself, and and I think one one of the one of the ways that we position ourselves is very much around being technology agnostic. Uh, again, this has been been touched on, so perhaps one that we can come back to. But you know how how we select the right technology, and and, and for us, we think it's important that we can provide a full range of technologies that are then you know chosen to be the most suitable for a specific site um but you know linking into perhaps how fast people might want to charge some of the constraints on on, on certain sites um and ensuring that the right technology is selected um to uh, to, to enable a, a good experience um a good experience for for customers um the other part is also software so we operate the gene point platform which is um, an, an, an in-house uh, or an, a proprietary piece of software that we built and we managed through our IT teams. And the Genie Point platform is essentially the cloud-based solution that joins together all of these chargers. And that gives both us and our customers the ability to, to manage chargers, to set pricing, uh, to enable people to actually come and start a charge, and then also deliver reporting in terms of how much those charges have been used, um, manage uptime, on, on the network uh, and ultimately ensure that we're delivering the best customer experience uh, through both the software and, and the hardware. Uh, could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, here we have, uh, again, sort of building on, on the previous point, you can see on the, on the right an example of, of, of some of the reporting uh, software that we have within Genie Point and uh, uh, yeah, make, making sure that all of this links, links up is absolutely critical. So every charger that we that we put on the network has been fully tested, uh, so we have a rigorous, um, rigorous process whereby it will become, uh, as we term it, gene certified uh, before any charger will will go live, and that just ensures that the charger and the software can talk to each other and and, and enable that uh, that experience to be delivered for customers. We could move on to the next slide. Uh, so, what I thought might be might be useful and, and may spark some thoughts and questions for, for later is to think about some of the trends we're seeing. Um, the first on, on the left is, is really the acceleration within this market. Um, and what we've seen um, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, um, despite all the challenges that, that you know, we, we know we faced um, at a global level, um, is, is significant growth. So to put it into context, um, our uh, the public charging network usage on that 2019 to 2020 increased by about 170 percent um even more marked on the private networks which are predominantly looking after fleets of vehicles and and uh, sort of business drivers on on their site uh, increase there was over three thousand percent which is quite phenomenal when we think about the fact that for a lot of the last 12 months you know we've been in and out of, of, of various restrictions on, on travel so um you know this this has happened despite uh uh yeah this, this, despite um all, all the challenges that, that that we know we faced and i think it, it's it's a mark of a couple of things um linking into some of you know the stats that, that craig had around the, the the increase in car sales we're seeing that continue to to to, to accelerate you know moving from as craig said uh, just over half a million EVs of which just over half of them are, are pure battery. You know, the forecasts are by 2025, 26, that will be two to three million and it will keep, you know, increasing to a point of seven or more million by, by 2030. Um, and uh, that, that has a massive impact in terms of the infrastructure we need as a, com as a, as a country uh, and the opportunity to, to start delivering and, and almost a requirement to start delivering these services for, for, for those drivers. Um, and I think this is also backed up by um, increasing certainty within uh, the sort of government circles around policy, uh, whether it's you know the benefit in kind um, uh, uh, benefits that, that are in place at the moment around the tax savings that can be made for individual drivers. Some of the grants that are available are for both cars and for and for installing infrastructure as as, as a business. Uh, and you know the the increased talk of, of the 2030 and 2035 uh, mandates on on tailpipe emissions and and all of this is coming together to to you know increase certainty and, and further accelerate growth within the market, which I think is, is very positive from a from an EV and uh, 
and broader environmental perspective. The second key trend is around integration. And again, this is a, this is a, a sort of been touched on and, and, and Alice talked around the integrating of services, which is which is key, but also from a integration of the EV experience. So what we need to think of uh, as we move into this market is that charging an EV is, is different than, than the world we're all used to with petrol and diesel. So, you know, when you're charging your uh, your, your petrol or diesel car, there's, there's quite a, you know, a, an established behavior or you go along to your petrol pump uh, every month or week or a few days, depending on how many miles you're doing. Uh, and, and that's that, it's pretty straightforward. Within EV, you've, you've got a mix of people who charge at home, at work, at uh, various different destinations, and, and, uh, and, and different customers have different needs and will charge in different places. We know the majority of charging will happen at home, but uh, that still leaves a you know, significant market there for, for destination and public charging, which, which we're seeing growth in. Uh, so as operators um, and as any, any player within this market, we need to start thinking about how do we tie together all of those experiences and also how do we tie together the experience with, with other services that customers may be, may be engaging in. And then the, the final part is, is really around experience and, and the customer experience. And just to jump back to the, the chart on the left, you know, what, what we're moving through at the moment is the move from an early adopter market, which are people who are really passionate about the technology, about um, the environment. And, you know, they, they've come into EV because that's something they really care about and they're prepared to invest their own time in, in making things work and in testing and trying and they like it because it's all new. Um, we're now moving into that mass market. Um, and what that means from a from a, from our side as, as an operator or anyone delivering these services is we need to ensure that we are delivering a great customer experience because once you move into mass market people are less forgiving of things that don't work they expect it just to work and, and frankly they don't have the interest to, to to invest their own time and energy in, in in working this stuff out it just has to be simple so a focus on customer experience is is is, is critical um uh, and it's something that there's also a lot of um, government consultation happening on at the moment, which we're heavily involved in to, to really set the standards for the industry going forward. Um, the things that you know we're we're looking at uh, around how we make it easy for people to pay, um, how we make it easy for people to understand what it's going to cost them up front, um, and how we increase uh, reliability and, and simplicity at, uh, at the charge point. So if we could just move on to the next slide please and then and then finally um i've sort of captured some consideration i think I, I i think quite positively a lot of this lines up lines up with what alistair and craig craig have already have already touched on but the, these are the key themes that we see coming out when we're working with customers who are thinking of installing assets whether it's it for their own use or for their customer uh, or public use so the first is is the commercial model so thinking about actually how how do you want this to work and and again we work with customers in different ways uh you know at one end where the customer will pay up front they will take the capital um investment uh the capital risk um and and have full control over those charges you know the other extreme we uh, as as ng are, are investing heavily in this market and we as i touched on you know we'll, we'll do deals with people who have access to, to land and to good sites where there'll be a you know a lease and revenue share agreement but we are taking all of that capital risk uh, and investment up front. Uh, so thinking about what, what model is right for you as a business, um, uh, where you are on that on that journey and, and you know, have it, having that, that looking at those different options is, is, is critical. Um, the second area is around location. So um, depending on where the charges are, will have a massive impact on how much they are used. And utilization is absolutely critical if you're looking for payback and, and generating um, you know, a benefit from, from, from those investments. So thinking about how do we get it in a place where there is need and, and where people use it? Um, how do you link it into other service offers? So you know, is it a car park or a location in the middle of nowhere where if you're charging there for an hour or so, um, you know, what, what else can people do? Or actually are there you know, retail facilities, leisure facilities close by and how can you tie those offers together? Again, some of these things have been touched on already. Uh, and then the practicalities of access to sites or power. Uh, and again, as Craig uh, detailed very, very well, you know, there's some quite significant practical considerations that, that we need to think about there. Um, there's a future proofing around actually um, the, the scalability of a solution. So what we typically see with customers is that they start small and then they will want to grow. 
uh, makes sense because at the moment we know that you know there's a lot less cars on the road than there will be in one year, in two years, in five, in ten years. So thinking about the scalability of the solution is really important, and also the technology. Um, uh, this technology is moving quickly. Um, Nobody quite knows exactly where the future will go within a within an early market like this, but doing as best we can to think, to consider the technology we installed today to give it the the best long term value and, and and payback. And then finally, and probably most importantly, the users, the customers themselves. Again, this has been touched on. So thinking about actually how do people use the parking facility, or, or how how do people use the site, and linking the technology, you know, perhaps the speed of charger with uh, with with the, that customer need, so you know, if it's a retail leisure environment where people might pop in for half an hour, an hour, then having rapid charges there makes sense. People can get a quick top up and move on. If they're going to be there all day because it's a commuter car park, for example, then you know, slower charges probably makes more sense. People aren't going to want to move their car uh, after after 90 minutes or so. Uh, and then and then finally, the the concept of sort of anchor clients. And again, this this touches quite nicely on on. Alistair's fleet farm concept. Uh, so, so one area where we've seen benefit and is definitely worth thinking about and, and perhaps one for discussion later is, is around being able to link large corporate users or business users into certain assets, into certain charging assets, because that gives them a sort of surety of, of, of base load of utilization. Uh, and again, we've got deals in place with the likes of, sort of rental car companies who, who need uh, significant charging, but they need to know that that um, they've got access to that and it's going to work, it's going to happen quickly for them. And that gives, you know, within certain assets that we've got, um, that gives us, you know, the, the, the confidence to install more and invest more. So the idea of sort of anchor users, of anchor customers is really important. So that brings me to the end of um, that, that sort of quick whistle stop through uh, who we are uh, and, and, and hopefully has given some thoughts for, uh, for a conversation later. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you um, very much, Simon. Yeah, for me, I'm very surprised about um, the take up during during COVID and how um, infrastructure has had showed significant growth. Um, we have got lots of questions coming in and I'm going to show my age now and um, put my glasses on to read them. So thank you very much for those. Um, uh, I hope the other panellists are going to join me now so I can see them and make sure they're paying attention. Maybe not Craig, but certainly um, be good to see Alistair and Simon. Um, perhaps uh, one that's come in, um, uh, which is a theme, and from from John Smith, maybe not his real name, um, but uh, he's asking quite rightly about enforcement uh, of EV spaces, um, and we I think both Alistair and Craig touched on that. Um, Craig, perhaps perhaps we could start with you. Um, how how do you see enforcing? And I, I think I think Simon called it icing. Is that correct? Um, but yeah. Craig, how how do you how do you see enforcement of these bays and, and perhaps misuse? So so the you know the, the, the non electric vehicle parking in charging bays. I mean, in in a council car park, there the parking place order restrictions would would enable us to enforce if somebody wasn't charging um, their vehicle. Um, you know, during the during the time, uh, I can't really speak for for contracted car parks, but I'm sure as to can pick it up in a minute. But um, there's also the option, um, which I think some charge point operators um, they will charge a levy if somebody if somebody's sat there not charging as well. I think over the time. So uh, again, Simon might be able to pick up on that more than more than me. I think from the so from from our perspective and icing and it, it's a um it's a contentious subject because we uh we want to encourage charging but we also want to encourage good behavior so we we have the ability to um to put in place for example some cctv some anpr to be able to assess who is who is accessing the the, the bays and are they using them appropriately so the most uh, i guess the most restrictive approach or or the most enforceable approach would be going down the route of a PCN. Um, I would, I'd like to hope that we'd, as we roll out more EV across the estate, we we adopt more of a, uh, we encourage people to take the right uh, approach. But you then have, from a from a parking perspective, if someone enters the car park, they don't have an electric car. The only spaces left are electric uh, uh, or EV charging bays. 
what do you do? So the permutations and um, uh, opportunities to fall over are, are fairly high, but ones that we're working through at the moment. But I think that it will eventually come down to potentially, as, as Craig alluded to, you, you change the price point when someone is full or they're not using the bay appropriately. And if they don't have the correct vehicle to enter the bay, then perhaps you go down the route of a, of a PCM. Yeah, from a um, so from a uh, an operator perspective, as as ourselves, we 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 tend to work closely with our partners. Um, so whoever the, the the sort of site owner is, to to look to enforce as, as best as possible. I think picking up on 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 Craig's point, we do have um, within Genie Point uh, what we call an overstay fee. So if a customer has charged their car, um, we've got a ninety minute limit on, on, on those sites and we have the ability then to, to charge them over state fees if they don't if they don't move after that. Um, clearly if it's a car that doesn't charge at all and it just turns up we don't have any any sort of relationship with it. And and quite interestingly we did we had to review over state fees within London because uh, there were certain parts of central London where it was cheaper to just park your car and then leave it there <laughs> than it would be to uh to, to, to pay for parking. So uh, that was one particular one we had to work with our our partners there to, to put in place a, a suitable solution but so icing is definitely a, it's an issue for the for the operator uh, or for anyone who's investing because as long as a car's parked there and not charging that that is you know stopping you being able to, to generate revenue from from that site great thank you Simon thank you for the rest of the panel um perhaps Simon one for you a theme that's coming through is um with the rapid increase in EV points and EV charging is the national grid going to be able to cope with all this yeah, that's a, a, a good question. I think um, there are there are costs involved with with grid upgrades, um, and I think you know on a site by site basis. Um, uh, again, you know, Craig had some really good detail on his slide around the, the realities of, of some of those costs. So, so we do see from a, a feasibility perspective uh, currently that um, there you know there are there are sites that become non-economic uh, purely due to, to grid connection. On a broader point. Um, we see EVs as, as forming part of the broader sort of energy transition that, 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 that is happening uh, both in the UK and, and globally. So what, what we believe uh, will, will happen and will continue to happen as we're, as we're seeing uh, with the increased use of, uh, of renewables, but also the increased use of sort of energy, energy management technologies. So whether that is you know, the installation of of batteries, uh, of, of solar and sort of local generation close to, to the point of use um, uh, and whether it's technologies like vehicle to grid where the cars themselves actually become part of a uh, of an energy management solution um, you know we, we believe that cars can actually play a part in, in helping better manage energy usage so you know one of the big challenges on the grid at the moment is that there will be over generation at certain times when it's for example when it's sunny and windy uh people aren't necessarily using a lot of energy too much energy is created uh if you can store that energy and then use it at a time when the energy is needed uh you you can you know without creating more energy overall you just better manage energy in the system so we believe that the the cars uh can form a part of of that mix and and they're part of the technologies that within energy through our renewables team um and technology teams where you know we're developing solutions to, to help uh, solve some of those issues great thank you Simon and um thank you John Smith John he's just confirmed it is his real name and he's not embarrassed to be in parking so thanks John for confirming that um perhaps one for for Alistair um what are your current charges so uh, if I go into an NCP car park and I'm an electric vehicle do uh, is there a differentiation between the charges for, for a charge point bay and a and a normal bay so great question uh, the simple answer is yes um the slightly long-winded answer is as i alluded to through when i was doing my piece is that historically we've rented out the space so you'll find if you for example were to look on uh, if you were to look for a charger so for example zap map or something like that um we've got a number of cpos operating in our car parks and they operate essentially they're standalone so you would need their app to go and access the charger so you would pay for parking and then you would pay um, the fees that they have associated maybe be it a connection charge and then a per kilowatt hour as we move into the to the new world of ncp uh, the current set of charges that we've got are, are what we term as b2b so they're exclusively for 
essentially season ticket customers where we provide them with a, an RFID fob to access them. As we move into a business to consumer world, uh, there will be a charge, we, to be perfectly honest, we're working out what that will be and how we will um, articulate that because we're conscious that tariff boards are quite uh, complicated in themselves. So if you go and then add EV on top of that, um, you may just cause unnecessary complications when what we're essentially looking to do is simplify the journey for the customer to make it easier for them to use. I think absolutely the last thing we want is more more sign, confusing signage I think on street or in car parks but uh, and Craig um, do you have examples of how you're currently charging down in Cornwall? Uh, very much the same as Alistair alluded to in terms of um, a charge for the charge point and um, but we also charge for uh, pay and display at the moment in, in the car park as well as the charge point cost whether whether we'll continue to do that moving forward I'm, I'm not I'm not sure but um, yeah it's part of our future policy setting I guess okay. thank you um, Simon first one for you um, it's a slightly technical one so I'm hoping you might be able to answer um, David Coates has asked is there any information that confirms the percentage of battery's lifespan that is shortened by the use of a rapid charger? So I think he is asking, if, if rapid, does rapid charging diminish um, a battery's lifespan? Um, that's a better, very good question. Um, if, if I'm absolutely honest, it's probably not one I can answer with, with credibility. I've got to be open on that. Um, it's not something that we've been uh, made aware of or we've had sort of specific concerns about you know we, we see rapid charging as um as well well it is a, a sort of critical part of the sort of charging infrastructure and you know enables uh, certain drivers uh, you know particularly those doing high mileage to, to be able to get the power they need when they need it and and continue on the journey uh, but yeah in in fairness to the question i couldn't i couldn't answer it with any sort of technical uh, Technical that's, that's absolutely fine. Neither, neither could I, so I thought I'd throw it at you and see what happens. Um, some in more interesting questions coming along. Martin Gubby, nice to see you're still alive, Martin. Haven't seen you for a long time. Um, Martin asks about um, pre booking and the sort of customer experience. Um, so if you're going along a motorway and you've pre booked a space, how does how does one ensure that it's it's available when you get there? So I, I guess this is probably one for Alistair um, and, and Simon, maybe. Um, it, it's not about enforcement as such, but how, how does one guarantee a pre-book and then stop the, the, the range anxiety? And the, I certainly think I would have anxiety having pre-booked and, uh, and I would be driving on the M4 panicking that some other person had parked in my pre-booked space. So maybe this is a PR question as opposed to an operation question, but Simon, how, as a provider of these, these hubs, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it's good. It's, it's another very good question. Um, and I was interested to hear actually Alistair's thoughts on that as well earlier on which I which I thought was very uh, very very useful it's an area we're looking at at the moment so we have probably unsurprisingly with with a number of partners we're having these conversations um, and from a technical perspective it's it's relatively straightforward to do so you know we could, we could launch a, a booking capability on the platform that enables the driver to reserve a charger the bit that we are working through and and in truth we don't have any clear answers so it'd be good good discussion on this one is some of the practical considerations so what happens if somebody doesn't turn up what happens if uh, you turn up and somebody's already there uh, if someone's there do you, do you need to then notify them that you know their their charge is going to come to an end and does it then stop automatically when somebody turns up but then if they're having a coffee and you know you get into all of the the practical you know particularly within the public space so i think depending on the location um we believe the pre-booking you know, pre-booking within a corporate environment is something we do already. We offer that. So, you know, if, if you're a corporate car park, you can pre-book and, and we can manage that because that's that's kind of governable. Um, in the public environment, it links back. It's back into the enforcement question or part of it is back into that enforcement consideration. So something we're working through and, uh, yeah, more than happy to engage in a conversation on it because we certainly don't know all the answers yet to, to how we'll most effectively do it. Well, as I say, perhaps we have maybe Harrison's on the line from YPS, he might be able to tell us, he's, he's um, an expert in pre-booking spaces, um, but if anyone else does have the answers to that, please do paste it in the question box. Um, uh, another question is coming from Manny, again, nice to, nice to hear from you Manny after a long time. Um, Manny asks, how do we stop people, sorry, how do we make or ensure people use the right charger? So 
they're using a rapid charger when they're there for a short period of time and a, a um, uh, obviously the longer charging uh, for a longer period of time. I, again, I think a lot of these are almost sort of enforcement questions. So maybe, maybe Craig, this is something that you could pick up on. Uh, I'm not sure I could, to be honest, but I mean, the, uh, I suppose the, the connection, um, I, su I suppose the connection to the vehicle um, could be distinguished um, in some way. Um, it's interesting the point about in, ensuring that there's space is available. I, I mean, I'm sure you'd probably have to build some resilience, wouldn't you, into into your um, infrastructure to ensure there were there was additional capacity available to to people if they were going to pre-book spaces. But uh, I suppose it's just making sure that it's the signage is clear and, and the information on the machinery is clear in terms of the type of type of uh, machine that they're actually or the charge point they're actually um, connecting to. I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, unsurprisingly, a, a long question from Nigel Willis. Um, Nigel says he drives an EV. One of his main issues with public charging is the ability to pay. Uh, and again, this is one or two questions coming in about this. So different apps, different payment um, methods, etc. Um, and he also goes on to say quite rightly that um, one of the main issues is ability to pay. He says it's own app and very few are contact lists. Added to the lack of maintenance, um, maybe Simon is, might be one for you, and it can be a bad experience. Um, and obviously, he says this goes on to to not really encouraging the general public to buy into the changing um, changing vehicles to EVs. You know, clearly myself included. So, is there a maintenance schedule you have with your your partners, your landowners, Simon? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, again another really critical area and as I alluded to when I was talking earlier the, the government is also consulting very heavily with the industry on this um, at the moment um, and I think there's, there's probably a few key things so I think within the industry we recognize or you know certainly within Genie Point um, and I can't speak for everyone but you know from our side we recognize that we need to keep getting better I think there's realities of how early this technology is and the market is that you know some of what's been done even if you go back a few years, um, you know, the, the progress that has been made in terms of hardware and quality and reliability is is, is marked and, and that will keep happening. So so it's getting better uh, and it's something that we are absolutely, absolutely focused on. So a few to pick up on the specific, uh, specific points. Maintenance. Yes, yeah, so we, we have an annual maintenance cycle on, on all of our charges um, and, and we also have live connectivity through the Genie Point platform to all charges so we can see what's online and what isn't. So proactive maintenance is a key part of what we do to try and to try and manage that. Um, there are there's a there's a grey area on maintenance that, that we've learned from experience whereby there, there are sites that we don't necessarily own. Uh, a customer owns it but then um, don't necessarily maintain it. Um, that is a challenge. So where customers have Ask for assets to be installed but haven't taken the maintenance package that does cause issues uh, from a driver perspective that's the most important thing and that's where you know we need as an industry to find a way to solve that again it's part of the government consultation um, from a payment perspective again um, probably one of the hottest topics at the moment how do we make it easy for people to pay uh, I think there's two key points on this um, uh, contactless is is happening much more um, nowadays it's an area that we just recently started installing on, on all of our new installs going forward will be will be contactless um, and then you know looking at a retrofit program um, it's not cheap it's further investment but it's something that you know we're hearing from customers so we're, we're looking at uh, implementing that um, and a lot of networks are in a similar place again the technology is quite new so this you know it's more complicated than, than it should be but but you know we're, we're, we're getting there and then the other piece is the interoperability piece which Alistair referenced Again, we're, we're now working with a number of uh, partners to, to look at how we can integrate the Genie Point network into other networks. So removing the need for customers to have lots of different apps. Um, and we believe this will be a growing part of, of the industry, particularly targeting specific, uh, specific sectors or specific types of drivers who will then you know, be able to have an app that meets the needs that they would have um, uh, to, to be able to charge when they need to. Okay, thank you. Um, Karen Stevens asked a question, which I'm sure is squarely in your box, Alistair. Will the provision of charge points affect business rates? Will the provision of charge points affect business rates? I 
I, I'm, I'm going to have to swerve that. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, apologies. No, so apologies, Carol. I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, I suspect they might, um, uh, but that would be something that uh, I don't know at the moment. Unfortunately. Okay. No, no, not at all. We don't. I'm not expected to know to know everything at all. Um, just, uh, it's probably worth while I just flick the others, just having a chat about compatibility. Certainly, again, a theme that's coming through is um, lots of different charge point providers. Um, as I don't have an electric car, but I understand that there are different sort of plugs and uh, etc. Um, clearly, this is a sort of uh, you know a race, and lots of organisations are looking to provide these charging points. Does, does um, perhaps start with Alistair? Maybe do do you see not just sort of from an NCP point of view, but do you see one organisation um, sort of taking over the whole of the UK, or do you do you believe that it will be multi-use, multi-app? Um, you know, the, the, the slickest come rising to the top, cream rising to the top, I suppose. I, to, to be perfectly honest, I hope it will be the latter. I think that'll make it much easier for everyone. I think, uh, and I'm not uh, in the, I don't have the expertise in the area of specifically around power and what you need from a plug perspective. So that sort of things. But our intention is to is to aim at 22 kilowatts for, for the offering we have across our uh, estate uh, and it certainly seems that the type 2 plug is going to be the, the most consistent offering but as I say I, I hope that we get to a stage where there is a consistent plug that is suitable for the various types of charging that you might have so I appreciate you may need one for, for your, your super fast Tesla type approach where you want 10 minutes of top up but for the more um, let's say the, the slower chargers I believe uh, and Simon probably knows far better than I do um, that the type two would be the would be the type. Okay, Simon. Simon, for those that can, yeah, Simon is nodding. So for those that can't see him, but you can, you all can. Um, again, this is probably one for you, Simon. Actually, um, Mike Erlin writes: um, When writing a business case for a public car park, what is the expected payback model for the EV units? Uh, I.e., you know, when do they start paying for themselves, or when is when is full payback? Yeah, that's uh, another good question. Um, so I think uh, so. In terms of the uh, the payback on a on a scheme, we would typically look uh, if if it was something that we were investing in ourselves uh, on on a rapid charging basis, uh, which is where a lot of our investment sits. Uh, we would be looking for quite a, typically a ten or fifteen year lease on that site um, to give us the sort of confidence of of payback. Um, I think for clarity. The payback is modelled, um, and, and every company will have its own, you know, spreadsheets with with various clever formula to uh, an S curve take up some various bits and bobs like we've got. Um, but the payback is modelled based on an, an assumption of future market growth. So I think the the really important point for today is that you know where where we are as an industry that you know there's not enough cars EVs on the road to to justify um, the the investment. However, um, we can see that growing and, and as I sort of alluded to earlier there's increasing confidence that that you know the growth uh, it's it looking like will actually be quicker than certainly we'd initially anticipated based off, off the number of sort of publicly available okay. so uh, so yeah it's you're looking at a long-term long-term lease um, and, and, and as a business you then take a call on uh, essentially what utilization how you believe that will grow over the time period okay well thank you Simon Craig one for you from um, uh, another Gavin as many of us in the parking industry now. Uh, Gavin Woolery Allen asks that during your presentation you talked about off street parking agenda for charge points. Um, has Cornwall Council got any plans for on street? And if so, what are they and sort of timescales at all? So there isn't any any current plans um, to implement on street, but um, it is being considered um, as part of. Um, future policy setting. So we're we're concentrating primarily at the moment on on off street car parks. Okay, thank you. And um, another one from Dave Coates. Dave has asked, um, do you think that car park operators will be forced to have a certain number of EV bays? Um, I think as they are forced is probably the wrong word. Um, as they are currently to have disabled bays. Perhaps, Alistair, is that something that you can see coming? I can see it coming uh, very much so, but I think if it does, then there needs to be, let's say, some support around how we get the 
the juice to the to the car park because if, we, if we're encouraged for example as i think new builds are something like 10 percent is a number i've bit i've been told then we obviously need to be able to provide you know if we've got a thousand space multi-story uh you know juice for 100 charges if 100 people turn up is is going to dim the light somewhere um unless we've got the right um unless we've got the right connections or we've got a substation close by that kind of thing so i i would I think it would be a fantastic thing to happen. It just needs to have everything else linked to it so that it can happen. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask Susan Nichols? I, I've got your question. I don't quite understand it. Perhaps if you've got seconds, you could just um, resubmit it so I can ask the panel. Um, Manny has asked a typical Manny question with lots of facts and figures, but um, Manny is asking, um, According to the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, 1.7 million public charges will be needed by 2030 and 2.8 million by 2035. These targets will require the installation of 507 charges every day over the next 15 years. Um, is this feasible? I, I can see Simon rubbing his hands together already. Uh, but Simon, is it? And actually, I, I had heard these figures um, over the last couple of days, and it does seem a, you know, a real stretch for the UK. Um, what's your feeling on that? Um, yeah, it's a good one. So, so interestingly, we're uh, as with a lot of companies, I'm sure we're in uh, doing a lot of business planning at the moment, looking to the to the future. And the view of how many charges will be required um, is uh, <clears throat> is is one that there's, there's some wildly differing differing views. So I think uh, uh, I know the SMMT number that was quoted uh, and that was actually used within a government report recently um, alongside some other um, alternative views uh, I think it's from the, uh, the climate change committee who were suggesting a figure significantly smaller than that so so I think I mean our, our view would be that that's probably on the, on the toppy side if I'm honest um, you know there's definitely significant growth within the market I think it comes back to uh, from a customer behavior perspective where will people charge and you know I think what the evidence at the moment is that home charging, um, workplace charging, and public all have a role to play. But a lot of charging activity will happen at home. There's clearly an issue where people don't have driveways, so you know, and that's where you get into some bigger volumes, I believe, on on sort of street parking. Uh, and already there is, you know, I think something uh, like thirty thousand or more um, public charges in the UK. You know, a lot of which are low-powered. Um, Street parking and, and in various locations. So I think there will be growth. I would, my, my gut feel, I might be proved wrong and maybe we meet up again in 10 years and see whether I was right or wrong. But I think uh, my, my, my gut feeling is that number is, is quite optimistic um, or on the high side. Uh, I think there is a, a requirement for more public charging significantly, but perhaps, you know, not to those sorts of numbers. If it is those sorts of numbers, I think we'd have a big problem. I'm, I'm hoping I've done my, I'm hoping in 10 years' time I've done my part time in parking, Simon, but you can, you can call me on the beach. <laughs> somewhere um <laughs> it's perhaps one for the whole panel um and again i'm not sure that we will know the answer off the top of our head but certainly um rachel we could probably contact you after rachel asked what are the best grants or funds for car park implementation i presume she's obviously talking about implementation of electric electric charging points within the car parks craig is that something that you would know um i alluded to it in terms of Cornwall um, earlier on in, in, in my presentation. So we've we've received European uh, development funding um, for a large proportion of the, the funding that we got, but we also had to match fund, you know, a proportion of that. So it's it's also whether or not the local authority is able to match fund to some degree to, to you know, receive that grant funding. Um, I think there are smaller grants available for individual charge points, but um, that would be more at a local, uh, sort of residential level, I guess, for individual charges. Okay, and Simon, we talked we talked earlier this morning about some grants and fundings. Um, do you what's your opinion on this? Do you, do you have any specifics in mind, or is that something we need to come back to to share with the listeners yeah. later? Um, so, as, as Craig alluded to, yeah, there's, there's home charging grants and, and business charging for, for um, installing uh, assets at, at a business. Uh, similar to, to what Craig was saying, we, we have experience working uh, with um, sort of all that funding. Uh, so we, we, we're just finishing rolling out um, a network of 103 rapid charges across West Yorkshire with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. That was one where actually NG 
uh, match funded the, the OLED grant. So similar structure, I think, to, to what Craig was uh, saying. Um, but but it does, I think those, those funding pots are important to particularly stimulate growth within certain areas of the country where, where we need to get more, more infrastructure. Um, in terms of other pots available at this moment in time, we need to we need to come back. But you know, it is it is an area that uh, I, I believe you know from a policy perspective, we're, we're I think you know seeing targeted funding is something that will be really important to to grow um, assets within certain areas of the country. Thank you, and I, I think I've kept Mark Moran waiting long enough. I can feel him kind of getting jumpy from here, so we'll ask <laughs> ask one of his questions. Um, Mark asks. Is the future of major car parks mo mobility hubs? Um, and it's a phrase I've heard a lot over the last, certainly the last five years, maybe even ten, where um, electric car hire, bike share, you know, access to trains, scooters, parcels, car washing, bike repair. Um, I mean, Alistair, how do you? What's NCP's view of, of turning their perhaps underutilised car parks into mobility hubs, for whatever whatever that means? And it does seem to change almost weekly. So it, it definitely changes almost weekly. Um, it sits uh, happily squarely in my lap from an intensification perspective and everything that is associated with mobility hubs from, as you say, lockers, car, uh, electric car hire, scooters, dark kitchens, dark supermarkets, uh, a weird and wonderful array of, of um, bits and pieces that you could stick into a, into a car park. I think it depends on the location. So we've got a couple of um, locations where we're in the process of, of uh, we're about to start some pilots with various bits of kit that will support, uh, I think what the government is terming, terming a sort of active, I think it's active transport or something like that. Uh, I might have got that wrong, but uh, essentially trying to promote some, some walking or people doing other things other than driving, which is obviously unfortunate for us given we do love a car. Um, but it's certainly something that we are we are working on our our parent company so park 24 operates north of i think 30,000 Nissan Leafs on a on a higher basis in Japan right. um uh, and and we might be encouraged to 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 look into that over here so i think there are many opportunities and certainly you know there, there's a lot of um land out there for that's taken up by car parks and they need to be used in different ways as as car ownership and the demographic of it changes. Thank you. Um, just a quick one, Paul Richardson from Brighton. Um, I, I actually would damn sure he'd know the answer to one of the questions. So Paul's come back and just for um, our listeners and panelists, OZEV funding is available for local authorities. So I, um, I'm sure OZEV means something to somebody, um, but yeah, that's that was the answer to one of the other questions. Um, we're sort of coming close to the end, but um, they're still coming in, which is great. Um, again, perhaps one for Craig uh, and Alistair. Um, Richard Mallet has asked about the size of bays. Um, and I think it's, it's in relation to having the charging points and the leads, you know, all over the place. Um, and certainly I have had my car dented in many a, a car park. I won't single out NCP as the, as the, uh, as the sole car park, but... Um, do you, are bays going to get bigger, smaller, stay the same size? I, th I think um, I, th I think they are. They tend to already be bigger um, to accommodate the leads, etc., that needs to trail around the vehicles, as you've mentioned before. But I think um, it would be nice if the vehicles were able to standardise the actual charge, you know, the plug-in point on the vehicle, because it would it would help uh not have to do that and obviously there is a direct impact on 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 other car users and um and the availability of space through providing more ev bays um, which has a detrimental impact on traffic management potentially because you've you've got to you've got to lose space to provide ev space at the moment that's the uh the impact the wider impact on on traffic management to the wider public unfortunately okay. I, I would agree from our side yeah no i'd agree from our side i mean so standard bays have got have got bigger, uh, and there is certainly an appetite, uh, you know, because EV, as, as Simon has, has has talked to so so aptly, EV charging is still very much in its infancy and it's gathering so much pace that when you see an EV a, a selection of EV EV bays in a in a car park, it's you know it's coloured blue, it's coloured green or yellow, it's 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 themed in sort of a destination. You've arrived somewhere where something special is going to happen. So that there is space created around it, but 
to Craig's point, it would be wonderful if all the you know if all the charge if all the plugs came out of the same place on a car, then you could um, you know you know what you were you were building towards. Uh, but also, the, some of the size of these new EVs that are coming out are are increasingly are increasingly bigger. So I think it's something we need to look at. Um, but any you know any increase in space has knock-on effects for other commercial aspects of the business. So it's a it's a balance we need to try and strike. Obviously, yeah, thank you. Um, both Mike and Adrian have asked um, Simon a direct question to you. Um, what is the expected utilization, or what is what is your experience of the expected utilization of a charge point? So per week, per day, um, twelve hours a day, twenty-four hours a day. Um, that would be nice. Uh, at the minute, it's it's, it's very small, um, if I'm honest. So you know, across the industry, uh, if you took a figure of around about two charges per day, or, 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 as an average, is is two, roughly two, where two charges, charges a day. Yeah. So if you do the maths on that, uh, that's that's why you know, back into that business case conversation, you know, we're looking at future utilisation uh, as 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 where the payback comes. Um, we're we're obviously seeing, or we are forecasting that to increase significantly uh, in the coming years, and it's and it's directly linked to you know forecast growth in cars. So um, yeah, we you know there there are there are already charges doing significantly more than that in certain areas. Uh, similarly, there are charges doing significantly less than that in other areas as well. So, uh, but it does average out at yeah, just just over two per day. Okay. Thank you. Um, actually, some a very interesting point from Paul Richardson, as I said, from Brighton, um, whose details I have. Paul has actually said we have installed over 250 charges over the last 18 months. If anyone would like help and advice, he is happy to assist. So, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I have his contact details, as I'm sure Land will do too. So. Um, please do get in contact with me um, if you'd like them. Um, we'll give we'll give Manny one more one more question um, as we just reach the end. Uh, can private parking operators, obviously, Alistair, this is this is one for you, make a reasonable level of profit with EV charging during the next five years of transition? Shall I read that again? What are you? <laughs> no, 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 no. I I think yes is is a simple answer. Uh, if you take you know any well not any but the majority of parking operators in the UK they have been fairly successful at making money in the lead up to EV and there is I believe a premium associated with with providing EV in in a in a parking environment so there is an opportunity for for a small price increase there and then as I alluded to the the fleet farm concept and the and the change in working behavior um, I think will lead to different companies using car parks in different ways. So we've, we've been speaking with um, some large fleets out there where typically if you work for them, you would you would get a van when you started with the company. That would be your van. You would take that van home and you would park it and you would use it the next day. As hybrid, flexible working, however you would like to term it, comes more and more into the into the play, people want to work less you know for example i want to work two days a week i want to work three days a week so all all of a sudden the the fleet's model changes and they need somewhere more central to park the vehicle charge the vehicle maintain the vehicle put more whatever they're going to put in it you know drinks wires cables whatever it might be so so the models do change so i i believe um that there is the ability to make some profit there investment you need to you need to make sure you strike that um correctly uh great um we are rapidly coming up to the last couple of minutes uh, again suzanne nichols I, I would love to ask your question i just want to make sure i understand it it's more about um parking charges sorry parking charges in conservation areas so um if you if you are still with us um just a slight explanation would help me ask the panel their opinion um uh, just a couple more. Um, I, I guess this is one that bothers me. I used to think that charging uh, in cities would, sorry, rural areas would be an issue. Um, cables across driveways, etc. Um, or for those who don't have drivers, but actually it seems to me that if you're in central London or Croydon, charging your vehicle when you live in a, uh, you know, a large flat, a large block of flats, will be difficult. I'm, I'm, I love the, the term fleet farms, Alistair. I don't know whether that was you or one of your marketing guys came up with that, but I think it's a fantastic term. How do you, how does the panel see charging 
yeah, um, 200 vehicles for uh, you know a block of flats in central Croydon. What's what's the answer there? Perhaps perhaps Simon. And we are rapidly running out of time, so sort of one minute max on on how do you see that working? Yeah, so I, th I think there's there's two two areas. Uh, one would be um, charging rates, um, which could link into that sort of fleet farm concept. Um, the other the other area is is on street, uh, which does cause issues. Of with areas to think about there in terms of sort of street furniture and clutter, etc. So I think there's two solutions, probably not not a full, not a clear route yet, but different different solutions for different locations, I suppose. Thank you, uh, Alistair. Thirty seconds. I I would agree with I would agree with Simon. I don't I don't see there's any any concern with the with the fleet farm approach. I think if you get the charging capacity right and everyone understands what they're going to get overnight, uh, then it is a very viable concept. Cool. And and Craig, this is a, the last question, and it will be for you. And I'm very grateful that Susan came back to us. Um, EBCs are street clutter. Um, should they be allowed in conservation areas? Um, Obviously, you live in a very beautiful part of the world. Um, are you going to be sticking boxes up in in the uh, in the car parks by the beaches? I think, as I alluded to earlier, one of the reasons why um, there isn't probably a proliferation of, of EV charges on street is is because of you know uh, our environment um, and the impact that they have. Um, I think we are going to have to see EV charging units installed in car parks, you know, be them rural, seaside. Um, because that, that you know that is what the public are requesting essentially. So uh, yeah, I think we will see them in in those locations. Perhaps not so much on street, um, where you know in conservation areas, perhaps where it's going to cause an issue. Cool. Well, guys, we are we're coming to the end. Just a couple of points. Um, Carl, an old old mate of mine, has said uh, emailed in to say that um, his company has created camera link to EV charge points to enforce non-use or non-payment, etc. If anyone needs help, so a quick plug there for Carl, which um. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I just I think it it um, just remains for me to um, thank everybody for their time. Um, it's been uh, you know incredibly useful for me. Um, I am probably halfway to converting to getting rid of um, the old landing outside, but um, it may take a, a longer discussion with Alistair, Craig, and Simon over a few beers to to finally get rid of it. Um, so just remains for me to say thank you to Alistair, um, thank you to Craig, and thank you to Simon. Um, I am obliged to thank the sponsors again. Um, so that's Landor and obviously um, the company I work for, Zap Park. Um, if anyone would like contact details for myself and Zap Park, and obviously Alistair, Craig, and Simon, um, please do get in touch. Um, and I believe that the recording of this will be sent out. Uh, to all those that registered and will be available um, through land or links as well. So, gentlemen, I'm very useful, very informative, um, very nice to, to, to connect with you all. Um, and hopefully next year, uh, or, or well, hopefully, no, hopefully next month, we'll be able to get together and um, have a face to face discussions and handshakes and, um, you know, back, relatively back to normal. So, um, again, thank you to Zach Bart, thank you to Landor, thank you to the participants, and um, hopefully we'll um, catch up soon.